We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Hello, my name is Ani Patel, and I'm glad to have the chance to talk to you about music and gene culture coevolution. When we think about what makes us human in terms of our minds, we naturally think of things like language or complex social cognition. But what about music? Music occurs in every human culture. It shows great diversity, but there are also some widespread features in terms of the patterns of rhythms and melodies that people make, the social functions that music plays, and the emotions that it evokes. Music is also very ancient. The oldest instruments we know of are actually around 40,000 years old. And of course, music is probably much older than that because singing doesn't fossilize. So is music part of human nature? Or to put it in modern terms, have we evolved neural specializations for music processing? Even though there's been an explosion of research in my field of music neuroscience in the past 20 years, we are nowhere near consensus on the answer to this question. That's unlike some other domains of human cognition. For example, there's broad consensus that we have evolved neural adaptations for speech and language, and that we have not evolved adaptations or specializations for reading and writing. Reading and writing are hugely important in human culture, but they're purely cultural inventions that build on brain circuits that evolved for other reasons. So what about music? Um, have we evolved neural specializations for music processing? Well, I just told you there's no consensus, so why are we even talking about this question? Well, two reasons. One, there are new lines of evidence that are rapidly emerging that are relevant to the question. Those new lines come from uh, neuroscience, cross-species studies of music processing in other animals, and studies of genetics along with other disciplines. Also, this question is relevant to some key issues in the study of human origins. In particular, the relationship between biology and culture in human evolution, and the distinctive features of human cognition. So a roadmap for this talk is that I'm gonna first talk about debates over the evolution of musicality, and then I'm gonna to turn to neuroscientific and cross-species work on musicality, focusing on musical rhythm. And then I'll talk about some recent genetic research before concluding. All right, before I launch in, I need to make a key conceptual distinction between music and musicality. Any given musical tradition is a product of culture and history, but all musical traditions rest on some basic cognitive and neural mechanisms that support basic musical behavior. Um, and these are thought to be widespread and they don't require formal musical training to develop. So I'm talking about basic musical behavior, not comp composing a symphony or playing an instrument at a high level, but basic things that support singing and dancing, the kinds of things that people can do without formal musical training. Um, so let's take an example to make this concrete. So one example of musicality is our ability to recognize transposed melodies, melodies when they're played in a higher or lower register. For example, on a piccolo or a tuba, you recognize the, the happy birthday tune on a piccolo or tuba, even though one is much higher and one is much lower, and you may have never heard them that high or that low before. We do this effortlessly and infants can do it. It doesn't seem remarkable to us at all. But surprisingly, it's not just how the brain works. It turns out that other animals that have complex auditory systems like songbirds can't do this. They can learn to tell the difference between two melodies, but if you transpose those melodies, they no longer recognize them. They have to relearn them as if they're new. So it's not just 
how the brain works, it's how the human brain works. And neuroimaging shows that this ability relies on some rather complex circuitry that connects the auditory cortex to different distant regions of the brain, including the parietal cortex. So this is an example of musicality, something that's widespread, that develops spontaneously and that we take for granted, but actually it turns out to be supported by some rather um, complex neural circuitry. And of course, musicality has many components. This is just one, but there are many having to do with pitch and rhythm and emotion and memory and so forth, and they fit together in the mind, kind of like a jigsaw puzzle of cognition. So let's turn to debates over the evolution of musicality. These debates are actually about 150 years old. Go back to Darwin, who argued that we are musical by nature because music served a courtship function in our ancestors based on his theory of sexual selection. He thought that our ancestors sang to attract mates even before we had symbolic language, kind of in, similar to what, how bird song works today. In sharp contrast, William James in Principles of Psychology thought that music was a fortuitous byproduct of how our brain worked. It was a pure cultural invention with no adaptive value in human evolution. These debates are still with us today. In fact, there's a couple of papers in press in behavioral and brain sciences that make adaptationist arguments for music. Savage et al. argue about the role of collective music making and promoting social bonding in our ancestors as being an adaptive function. And Mare et al. talk about collective music making as signaling group strength or size. Um, these are just two of many adaptationist arguments, but they're recent and I thought I'd point them out. And these arguments um, often focus on collective music making having a kind of synchrony where people move together and, and synchronize their voices in ways that don't occur in ordinary language and which promotes in-group prosociality as shown by experimental research. Well, in sharp contrast to that, there are modern thinkers, very prominent thinkers, including thinkers from anthropology and psychology like Daniel Sperber and Steven Pinker, who've argued that music is a purely cultural invention and have made very specific arguments about how music happens to activate brain circuits that evolve for other reasons like language or motor control, emotional calls and so on. So we still have this dichotomy between adaptation and cultural invention in terms of the theory and debate over musicality. But what's happening recently is the idea that maybe there's a way beyond this debate. Perhaps music originated as an invention which then influenced biological evolution. And actually Savage uh, et al. explored this in their paper. And this is related to the broader idea of gene culture coevolution. This is the idea that there's a feedback loop in human evolution between cultural innovation and biological evolution. Now, this idea has been around for a while. It's been written about by many prominent evolutionary biologists and by people spanning fields from population genetics to uh, philosophy to um, evolutionary biology and, uh, and so on. I've listed a few references here on the slide, um, but let me just quote from a couple of these references to give you a flavor for this idea. This quote is that culture normally evolves more rapidly than genes, creating novel environments that expose genes to new selective pressures. This is from Richardson, Boyd, and Henrik. Um, the smallest, most trivial new habit adopted by a hominid species could, if advantageous, have led to selection of genomic variations that sharpen that trait, be it cultural exchange, creativity, technological virtuosity, or heightened empathy. And this is from Fisher and Ridley. So you get the idea that cultural innovations can then change the selective landscape, which will favor or disfavor certain genetic variants. And this idea is actually already pretty well accepted for some human traits. For example, the evolution of lactose tolerance, whereby some populations that began to keep animals and drink their milk, there was selection for genetic variants that favored the ability to digest lactose as an adult. And we see that good evidence for that in, in genetic diversity today and how it's correlated to lactose tolerance. Going back to the species level, uh, gene culture coevolution. Richard Wrangham and others have persuasively argued that the control of fire was an important step in human evolution that had coevolutionary consequences for things like digestion. Cooking made food easier to digest, to chew and digest, and so, for example, our jaws got smaller and our digestive tract got shorter over evolutionary time. So in recent years, there have been a number of people writing about the possibility of gene culture coevolution when it comes to musicality. And I've listed a few references here on the slide. Um, and I'm one of a, a number of people that's explored this idea, that's beginning to explore this idea. But how can we find out if music actually triggered gene culture coevolution? Well, here's where we need to synthesize evidence from different disciplines, including neuroscience, cross-species research, and genetics. So what I want to do now is talk about neuroscientific and cross-species work on musical rhythm. And I'm going to focus on a particular aspect of musical rhythm. Musical rhythm, of course, is hugely complicated and has many facets but I'm gonna focus on one aspect called uh, beat perception and synchronization. This is our ability to sense a beat in complex rhythms and to move in synchrony with that beat. And 
this is something we see all over the world. I'll play a short clip of uh, music from Stevie Wonder, which will help us uh, all get on the same page with what beat perception and synchronization is. And just try and feel free to tap the beat of this uh, music as you listen to it. So there you have a complex uh, melodic and rhythmic pattern that is invoking an underlying metronomic sense of a beat that you synchronize to, as I did when I uh, snapped. So two key cognitive features of what I'll call BPS um, are prediction, uh, that is we always are implicitly predicting the timing of the next beat, and that's shown how, by the fact that when we tap or snap we're often a little bit ahead of the beat, not behind it and reacting to it. And tempo flexibility, we can do that easily when the music is slower or faster over a pretty broad range. BPS emerges without formal training. Um, it's very widespread in human culture in terms of music, and it's a key to collective musical behavior of the type that I talked about before in those theories about how that might have promoted social bonding in early humans. Now, there is a theory that the sense of musical beat is just kind of tapping into ancient and widespread rhythms in animal biology. You know, animals have heartbeats, they have gait, they have brain rhythms, they have rhythms all over the body. And this idea is that we don't need any evolved neural specializations to support beat perception. It's just kind of a byproduct of how biology works. In 2006, and that idea actually goes back to Darwin. In 2006, I proposed a very different view and that there, there was a, a specific neural origin uh, or pre-adaptation for BPS was based on vocal learning. Let me try and explain that. I was struck by how neural research was showing that beat perception engaged a rather complex circuit, uh, as illustrated in this image from my colleague, Jessica Gran, involving a number of brain regions in premotor cortex, in auditory regions, and deep in the brain in the basal ganglia and their connections. So it's not a simple brainstem ability. It's a, it seems to recruit a complex brain circuit. And this circuit, to me, had some striking resemblances to a circuit that humans have, but that other primates don't have for complex vocal learning, our ability to imitate complex sounds. And this is an image from the work of Eric Jarvis showing a human brain and a primate brain in a schematic form, and the kinds of connections that he believes support vocal learning in humans that are not present in non-human primates. And there are some resemblances in the brain areas and their connections that we see in beat processing. So the hypothesis was, was that vocal learning uh, laid the ground for beat perception and synchronization in evolution. And the, the thing about this hypothesis uh, that was interesting is that vocal learning is a rare trait. You only see it in a few groups of mammals, us among, uniquely among primates, but also in dolphins, elephants, uh, some bats, and some seals, and in three groups of birds, uh, the parrots, the hummingbirds, and the songbirds, so not chickens or many birds that you're familiar with. And the, the prediction of this hypothesis was that most animals are actually not capable of beat perception and synchronization, um, unlike the view that it just stems from widespread rhythms in animal biology. So subsequently, there was some research that was actually consistent with that hypothesis. Pioneering work from the lab of Hugo Mershon in Mexico showed that monkeys could learn to tap along with a metronome, a simple form of beat perception and synchronization, but they did it very differently from humans. They always tapped a few hundred milliseconds after each click as if they were mostly reacting rather than predicting. What about great apes? Hattori and colleagues showed that chimpanzees could actually synchronize with a metronome at one tempo, predictably, but didn't show any evidence for tempo flexibility, which is another key feature of BPS. Then in 2009, we published the first study, experimental study showing predictive and tempo flexible BPS in a non-human animal, a parrot named Snowball. And then another group in the same year published a survey study where they looked across YouTube for any animal that seemed to be doing synchronization with a musical beat and they were only able to find vocal learners, mostly parrots, so no dogs, cats, and so on. And these parrots all showed these sort of short bouts of BPS, not as good as a human that can go for long periods of time, but these episodic, but still significant bouts of BPS. Later, the story got more interesting as people were able to train vocal non-learning animals like a sea lion to actually do BPS. And then I was involved in a, some work that did this also with monkeys and other groups have done it now too. And that's been very interesting, but the only animals that seem to do BPS spontaneously without kind of special training are vocal learners. And I wanna show you just briefly a uh, clip from our study of Snowball uh, to illustrate BPS in a non-human animal. This is Snowball moving to uh, 
the beat of a song that has been sped up from its original tempo. Just test and see if he can stay on the beat. And as you'll see, it's a little fast for him, but he figures out a solution at the end. So that's a clip of Snowball, and he's never been uh, trained to do this. He's not given any food rewards for this behavior. This emerged through social interaction with humans. Um, so this leads me to believe that vocal learning was likely a pre-adaptation for BPS, that uh, in our ancestors, our vocal learning ancestors, our, that ability could have led to fortuitously to short bouts of beat perception and synchronization when we interacted with each other. And that's kind of interesting, but then you might wonder, well, how did our primate heritage, we did evolve from primates and apes, so how did our primate heritage contribute to musicality? And we know parrots don't sing or dance in coordinated social groups, and humans do. So I think our primate heritage is actually very important for the evolution of musicality, because we do see social chorusing in chimpanzees and bonobos, for example, pant hooting in chimpanzees or high hooting in bonobos. And both males and females do this, it's not just one sex or the other. And when they do it in social groups, there's evidence for some convergence in the timing and acoustic structure of calls, and it also seems to be related to social bonds. This connects back to the idea that music may have had some sort of social function when people brought their voices and their movements together synchronously in time in human evolution. And so let me show you a, a brief clip of pant hooting from my colleague um, Zarin Machanda at Tufts to give you a sense of this. This is chimpanzee pant hooting um, taken at her field site. <laughs> So it doesn't sound uh, exactly like human singing and it doesn't look like dancing, but there is some uh, simultaneous vocalization, maybe some convergence in the sounds and their structure. And so I think that it's possible that vocal learning plus this kind of social chorusing in our hominid ancestors could have led to group singing and dancing as cultural innovations. And if this influenced survival, perhaps because of its effect on social bonding, this could have led to gene culture coevolution. Now, that's an interesting speculation, and it suggests that after this invention, there could have been selection for neural specializations for sustained and stable beat perception and synchronization versus the kind of short bouts we see in parrots. But all of this, of course, depends on whether there are genetic variants that contribute to beat perception and synchronization abilities. And is that really the case? So let me turn now to talking about some genetic work. There has been some recent genetic work, actually, on beat perception and synchronization. Prior twin studies suggested that there were genetic influences on rhythmic aptitude. And then, excitingly, and very recently, there's been a large-scale genome-wide association study of beat perception and synchronization. And this involved research from 600,000 in genotyped people who answered the question, can you clap in time with a musical beat? And the data was provided by the, the gene company 23andMe. This was followed up with an online validation study showing that people's answer to this question really did uh, correlate well with their actual BPS abilities. In this study, they found 67 significant loci in the genome associated with BPS, with a SNP-based heritability of about 15%. And they found that these genetic associations with rhythm were enriched in brain areas involved in BPS, which is a good reality check that this actually has something to do with the behavior of beat perception and synchronization. This plot shows the Manhattan plot from their study, and I know the, the symbols are hard to see, but just to give you an idea of the significant uh, loci that showed up across multiple genome, genes in the chromosome. So it's a polygenic trait, complex trait. So from a cognitive perspective, one of the interesting things about this study was that genetic correlations between BPS and other complex traits were modest. And from an evolutionary perspective, an exciting thing was that two of the loci they found are in human accelerated regions. These are regions of the genome that have changed extensively since our divergence from our common last ancestor with chimpanzees. So I think these findings are actually consistent with gene culture coevolution for BPS, which is a core feature of human musicality. So in conclusion, is music part of our evolved human nature? Well, new lines of evidence are rapidly emerging that's actually helping us address this question. And I think that 
we can actually answer this question in the coming few decades and settle a 150-year-old debate about human nature. Of course, answering this question will require synthesizing work from neuroscience, cross-species studies, and other fields. And it will also inquire, uh, require studying multiple components of musicality, so not just rhythm and not just BPS, but things like the ability to match pitch with other voices, uh, the ability to remember music. Um, there are many components to musicality, and BPS is just one. The emotional responses we have to music are another big area of research. And of course, it will be really important to study how music varies across culture and time. This means the sciences will need to team up with the humanities, in particular ethnomusicology and musicology. And if it turns out that music has been subject to gene culture coevolution, it may be a powerful system for studying cognitive gene culture coevolution. So not just how gene culture coevolution changed our gut or our jaws or our digestion, uh, digestion of various nutri nutrients, but actually how it changed our minds. And of course, even if music is a purely cultural invention, Cross-species research on musicality can reveal new insights into animal cognition and into what's distinct about the human mind. And with that, I'd like to thank, our spot, to thank my sponsors uh, who have supported this work and also thank you for your attention.